So before I get into the sermon, um, I wanted to thank everybody that was part of adopting those three families at the school. Um, I dropped the stuff up on Thursday, and it, I had the principal come out, the assistant principal come out, several teachers come out, and just be so thankful that we took on those three families. And I know there was a lot of kids, there was a lot of stuff that we had to get, but believe me when I say it was not only an outreach, it was a blessing to these families. And from my understanding, they if it wasn't for us, they would have literally had nothing. Um, so the food cards that we bought, the gas cards that we bought, the presents that we bought, that is they're gonna be their Christmas and they actually have something now. So I wanted to express thank you for everyone at this church that did that and poured into these families. And um, again, in the new year, I don't wanna stop with just Christmas. I wanna try and do this stuff year round, whether it's clothes or shoes or books or backpacks. Um, we have a good relationship with the school that I wanna keep and I told them if there's ever a need, even if it's an electric bill and we can help out pay that electric bill for a month, I want us to be that light right now. So uh, again, thank you. Um, today is the part two of the light that is Jesus. And um, my family went to do, what is the light thing called? We went to? Illuminations. I'm a big geek when it comes to Christmas lights. All of you that came to the Christmas party saw my house, you can see it from space. Um, there's something elegant about light. Um, I've never been a fan of dark. I've never liked the dark. And it's not because I'm a scaredy cat. It's in the dark, so many things can be hidden. When it's brought to light, you can't hide anything. And that's the key for fellowship. That's the key of Jesus coming. We can't hide. You can hide in the dark all you want. But when it's lit up, you can't hide anymore. So a little review of part one was John 1, the word became flesh. This is what we learned of Mary going to be pregnant, conceived, virgin, having birth. But not only that, we also hear of John the Baptist, who was also born of an older lady that probably went through menopause, that the chances for getting credit were pretty much zero to none from our understandings, but God had other plans. The second thing that we looked at was Luke 1, 26 through 8, the birth of Jesus foretold. So we know John the Baptist baptized Jesus, but we also know that John the Baptist came before Jesus to start showing the way. And it's ironic that both of their births are talked about in the same passage near the same time. And then the last part was Matthew 1, 18 through 25. We talked about the trials um, of a young woman. Nowadays, if a teenager gets pregnant or someone else had a wedlock, no one bats an eye. Back in the day, that was not so, especially in this time. It's something you could have been stoned for, for being adulterous or being outside of marriage. The, the, the ironic thing is, I could not imagine being a young woman being told, oh, FYI, we know you're a virgin, but you're gonna have a kid. And the person that she was betrothed to had to accept that as well, and that's what we read in Matthew 1. I can tell you right now, I don't know what I would have done. Knowing that I was supposed to be marrying this woman, she was for me, we were for each other, and then to find out she's pregnant, how would you react? I don't know if I would react, but we also saw how angels would come to them and talk to them and guide them through it, saying, look, this is of God, this is not of the world. They both accepted it. They both moved on. But here's the thing that we talked about again last week. Who did the angels show up to? Mary and Joseph. Yes, and the yeah. We're getting the shepherds today. But uh, those two. So you have to understand, in this, this time where this is not okay to be, they were all alone in the world. They were trusting and had faith in God that what was happening to them was the truth. And they still had to deal with the negative notion that he was marrying someone that was already pregnant. So you understand. Again, today we can't understand that because today if someone gets pregnant, if someone, it, it's, it's, it's all over the place. Back then, not so. So we're going to keep reading about it. Today we're going to talk about, with, uh, we're going to start with Luke 2, 1 through 21, the birth of Jesus. In those days, Caesar August issued a decree that the census should be taken of the entire Roman M world. See, starting off the bat, we can see God's plan working in motion. He hasn't done a census 
in years that we know of from this point. But all of a sudden, Jesus is coming, and now there's a census. Now, what does this do? It fills prophecy from the Old Testament. And everyone went to their own towns to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth to Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. Now, we know from Old Testament prophecy and Old Testament scripture, he had to be from the house of David, Joseph, and Mary. They had to register in their hometown. They had to go back. This also where the place was supposed to be born. Where was he supposed to be born? It was foretold. Bethlehem. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to marry to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Now, we all know the manger scenes that the world tells us was Jesus's. I'm popping. Gotcha. Um, of Jesus's. Um, we picture this little cute hay and manger and, and it was this little house. Is it popping still? Better? Okay. Um, it's got to go with facial hair. Here, hold on. There. Good. And the thing is, it was probably more like a cave. It was probably a little dugout cove. And it was a manger. What it was a manger? Well, it was used to host hay. I mean, it was to feed donkeys. It was to feed horses. It was to feed those things. But here Jesus is, God, in human flesh, born basically in a cave on top of a feeding trough. If that doesn't show humility, I don't know what does. God could have came any way he wished, any way that he wanted to. He chose to come in this way. He chose to be lesser than, to be the first. See, we're told to be last, to be first. Jesus not only did that through his birth, he did that throughout his entire ministry. And the next part, we're going to just talk about shepherds. And before we do, shepherds, you think that was a good occupation or looked down on? Yeah, it was looked down on. It, it was, if you were a shepherd, you were the low of low of low of low. Now, we just went through the book of John. And if you're going to do a miracle, if you want your message put out there, if you want to stand firm, do you pick a shepherd or do you pick a king to go do your message? Who's going to have more access to get the word out? Who's going to be more believable? Who's going to get it out there? But what did God do here? Did he go to the kings? No, because we're going to learn here in the next passage why he didn't go to the king. But instead, he went to somebody that was already humbled by their career. They were already thought of as nothing. This was good news to them because they had nothing. A king has everything to lose. A shepherd boy that lives in the field has nothing to lose. Just like in John, who did Jesus appear to first? It wasn't the disciples. It was a woman. And again, speaking Old Testament terms, if you wanted a story to be believable, you would not have the woman and women be the first ones to witness and tell the story. You would have had men. And why do I say this? Because if I'm going to lie and make up a story and have it documented throughout history, I wouldn't go the route that's less believable. I would go the route that was more believable. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Note again, every time we hear about an angel appearing, what happens? People are terrified, aren't they? Mary was terrified. Joseph was terrified. But what does the angels, the first thing they do is what? But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. 
I bring you good news that was caused great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior was being born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. See, I, I believe the reason why we get terrified when God starts to show up, it's not that we're scared, because it's something scary. I believe we can't handle the magnitude of the glory that's being seen in front of us. An angel is sinless. An angel is the closest thing to God. It's creation. You, they were created before us. They were here before us. And I can tell you right now, if God ever poofed, showed up right next to me, I'd be in fear. I'm not worthy enough to stand in his presence. But the best part about Christmas is what? How do we get there? We need a savior. So he shows up to them. The angels told them. Again, the lesser people, the low-end people, the people that no one cared about, were the first ones to hear about it. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angels, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heavens, and on earth peace to those who have his favor rest. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see these, this thing that has happened, what the Lord has told us about. If you're an intelligent person, say you're a scientist, Stephen Hawkins is a, a good example. The man was intelligent, no one can take that from him. But with that intelligence, with the fame, with the money, he couldn't even see the proof right in front of him, could he? If you went to, if, if God went to somebody that had everything, like a king, a pre, or, you know, even the Pharisees, let's even talk about the Pharisees. If he went to the Pharisees, we all know from the, from the New Testament, how the Pharisees react. Bad, real bad. They were arrogant, they were cocky. They thought they knew it all. They, they were the upper ups. He went to shepherds. What's the first thing the shepherds did? They went to go look. They didn't sit there pondering. They didn't make some skeeving plan or do this or that. The first thing they said was, okay, angels just appeared to me. They didn't contemplate. They didn't say, oh, there's no way it's true. That can't be right. This, no, let's go see him. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this, this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. They believed. They saw, well they heard, they put in action their faith, saw, believed, and then spread the word. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Why do you think Mary did that? Do you think it's because she didn't believe what was happening? Do you think it's because here's her firstborn? There's many reasons why. She just gave birth as a virgin. I don't know about you. That, that's pretty intense even if it's from God. And we also know from the last week, Joseph did not touch her until after Jesus was born. It was such a holy thing that was happening. His own wife, who they were married, they had the right to consummate, did not, because she was bearing God. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was con conceived. Now we're going to go to Matthew 2. Yep. The Magi visit the Messiah. Now, the biggest thing here, Magi, 
They were wise men. They were false uh, star seekers. So the first thing you have to understand is they studied the stars. They, they understood how the world, the days, the, the things were ending. They were very, very intelligent men. But I can also tell you this too, like the major scenes show today, they were not at his birth. They did not show up like the shepherds did. In fact, Jesus was probably three before they even got to him. And there's proof vividly that this states it as we're going to read. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now, this is progressive of years of them following the star, finding out where Jesus is. This is the first the king, Herod, has heard of this. Let's see what his reaction is. When King Herod heard that he was disturbed, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem was with him. Now here's the sad thing. Who are the Jews? God's chosen people. Who knows the Old Testament? Not Gentiles like us. The Jews were raised. It was their life. It was not just something they did on Sunday morning. Their entire world revolved around understanding Old Testament scriptures and prophecies and one day pointing to the Messiah coming. The star, the virgin birth, where the baby was born, where the bloodline came from the baby, all filled Old Testament prophecy. And what did they do? They were disturbed. And all of Jerusalem with them. So again, here we have the light of the world, the savior of the world, the savior of his people coming into the world. And already, as a child, people are disturbed by his presence. Once again, when bad things are exposed to light, what happens? A little to scatter. So my wife and I were shopping yesterday uh, for the Christmas party and for different things. And uh, my phone went off. I have video cameras and security system all around our house. And it's alerted to my phone. Well, come to find out, someone was trying to break into our house. Here's the ironic thing. I have I took the measures. We have security gates, we have alarms, we have cameras. And those cameras have speakers on them. So I can talk. Not to mention my 100 pound pit bull, who's, how do I word it? Friendly if he knows you, but if you don't know you, don't come around. The guy was greeted by my dog by the back door. That freaked him out. He started to run, and as he ran, I was talking to the speaker, yelling at him, I got you on camera, good luck. Now what did I do to him? I exposed him. See, he was trying to do something shady, sinful, dark. And if he thought no one was watching, he was gonna keep doing it. But what happened when I exposed him to light? He ran. He got scared. This is where Jerusalem is. You have to understand, when Jesus came, it was the right time. Obviously, in God's timing, it was always the right time. It was a dark world that we lived in. Jews were doing things outside of the Old Testament that they weren't supposed to be doing. They were mixing. They were doing other religions. I mean, how many times did they build a golden calf? You know, I mean, how many times did they do those things? So the Messiah came into a dark world. And the first thing he did was start to expose the sins, the dark things, the bad things, because he's the ultimate light. And what was their first reaction? They were disturbed. Good. Because guess what? That means they're starting to wake up. When he had called together all the people's chiefs, priests, teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied. For this is what the prophet has written. 
And this is Old Testament prophecy. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means last among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So who did Jesus, uh, when Jesus was born, who was the first one snowed by an angel? Shepherds. Shepherds. This Old Testament prophecy says Jesus is going to be a what? Shepherd. Shepherd. Coincidence, huh? No. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the ex exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. Was that his plan? No. God knew, though, didn't he? Oh, yeah. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And there the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Now here's the thing. People are always looking for proof. And we have a video, and Wendy's not in here, she's with the children. I forgot the name of the video, but it's basically about, it's, I'm pretty sure it's called the Bethlehem Star. And it, it's an astronomer who was not a believer. And he wanted to prove there's no way a star could have shined like that and could have felt like they were following it because that's not how stars work. Guess what happened when he tried to prove it wrong? Basically with software, yep, basically with software, he was able to wind back the star patterns over centuries and centuries and centuries. When he did, there was not, um, there was a star. I can't think of the word, but there was a star. And ironically, during the time of when Jesus was born, the same date as he found biblically, there was a star that was rotating. And it would have led them just the way they were supposed to go. Now this is science. This is not biblical. This was using biblical time frame. This was using biblical dates and understanding. But it was modern science trying to prove the Bible wrong. And all it did was convict him to become saved. Because he could prove without a shadow of a doubt there was a star brighter than any other star that actually moved for months. And if you were on Earth, it would appear as if it was always in front of you to follow straight to where Jesus was. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the, the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. A few things. If he was an infant or a baby, the Bible would have told us that. What did they call Jesus at this time? Child. He was no longer a baby when they found him. The other thing that people get a little confused with is they think because of all the major scenes and different things that there was only three wise men. Well, that was never the case. They usually traveled 10 or 12 in a group. Now, there was three gifts. We know that for sure. But that's why people assume there was only three of them. No. There was more. How many? I, I don't know exact numbers. I, I, but I can tell you it was more than three. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And had been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod. They returned to their country by another route. Now, God ultimately had the, everything worked out, didn't he? He aligned the stars to guide them. He sent his angels to tell. He picked Mary. He picked Joseph. He knew how Herod would react. He knew how uh, the Jews would react. So what does he do? He sends another angel and another dream, telling them, don't go back. So they went another way.
it's hard, I understand, to kind of understand why God, all-powerful, all-knowing, would do this. It's a simple answer. He has grace and love for us. See, he created us in a perfect manner. He created us to commune with him. And we could, there was a point in the garden, we walked with him. Our descendants, Adam and Eve, walked with God. We knew no shame, we knew no sin. But who broke that? We did. See, this plan was already set in motion before we even existed. He knew we needed a savior. He knew the way the Jews were doing it wasn't going to last forever. He also wanted a way that, yes, the Jews are his, his chosen people, and they always will be. But he wanted a way for every single human being to be brought back to God. He needed an ultimate sacrifice, an ultimate pure sacrifice. And who's the only thing that we know of that's perfect? God. He came as an infant. He fulfilled, even in his birth, just leading up to his birth, he was already fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. Not to mention what Jesus did when he grew older and started his ministry. See, during this time, it's, it's, it's great to be around family. It's great to have Christmas decorations. It's great to be around all those things. But let's not forget the true joy and light and where it comes from this holiday season comes from one thing, and that's God. It's Jesus' Son. I have a couple of reflection questions. Has anything ever happened to you that you later understood to be God's plan, even though at the time you did not see God's plan? This has happened to me a few times in my life. There was a job I really, really wanted. The company flew me out. I did the interview. They, they were setting up a contract for me to sign. And something inside me told me not to take it. Now, this would have set my family up. We would have been fine. My wife wouldn't have had to work. We wouldn't have been in Arizona. But we would have, we would have been okay. But something told me not to take it. And those that knew John, three months later, guess who I met? John. God had already set a plan up. I couldn't see it. I didn't know. But if I would have taken that job, I wouldn't be here right now. And I know where I'm supposed to be. So, during over the week and the holidays, just really reflect on that. Has there ever, has anything ever happened to you that you later understood to be God's plan? Even though at the time, you did not see God's plan. I can tell you, four years ago when I had that job and that contract in front of me, I was angry. I'm like, God, really God? Like, come on. Looking back now, four years later, I get it. Next one. Have there been times in your life when you failed to make room for Jesus? I bring this question up because God living outside of our time and understanding, he knew how Jesus was going to be born. He knew there would be no room. He knew everything. But for us in our life, is there a moment where we had no room in the end? Was there a moment that we could have done something or stepped out in faith or... We just didn't have the time. We didn't have the room. Or we just didn't want to. I've been there. I'm, not, I'm ashamed to admit it, but I have been there. I think we all have. We get so busy and caught up in our own world that we forget why we're here in the first place. And the last one? 
Have there been times in your life when you knew God's plan, but circumstances seemed to be in conflict with that plan? Again, if I'm the only one, I'll take it. But I've been there. And, uh, and just being honest with the church right now, when John passed and I was asked to step up, it was hard for me. I had bills due. I had different things that needed to take place. But God was calling me to take it on no matter what. Struggling, kicking like a little kid. I went through some growing pains, as Jeremy knows. I accepted the position and stepped up as the new pastor here. A few months later, outside of my shame of saying, God, I don't want to take it, even though I know you want me to take it, my bills have been paid every single month. My kids have been taken care of health-wise, insurance-wise. Now, if you would have asked me that four months ago, no. See, if we're in God's plan, and I know this is hard to understand, it's a lesson I learn every day. There's never been once in my entire life that I've never been hungry, or I've ever been outside in the rain, or that I did not have someone to pour into me. If we choose to follow God and we accept his plans, no matter if they don't make sense to us or not, believe me when I say God will take care of you. It may not always be the way you think. It may not always be. And this is not about money. This is not about those things. This is about God providing in so much, so many more ways. I know where I'm supposed to be because guess what? I don't stress about the small things anymore. I feel comforted where I'm at. I know my purpose for right now. When you're in that, the rest of those worries melt away. If you're facing an unbelievable circumstance and you say there's no way, guess what? I am telling you this with all the fibers of my heart. Yes way, because we serve a God that doesn't understand our limitations. And again, don't mix my words. I am not saying if you do this, God will do this. What I'm saying is if you're in God's will, he will take care of you. He will provide for you. And that does not always mean money. That does not always mean food in some cases. But he will provide for you. Please pray with me.